Hi, everybody, and welcome again to another Tech and Talk. Um, Tech and Talk is a podcast we've started this summer, um, bringing you some fresh ideas and some deep dives on things mostly cloud natively, um, but from all sort of different parts of the technology that is that we get to use um, in our cloud native application. So sometimes we'll sidetrack, but today uh, we're not sidetracking. We're really going to go for some um, an interesting conversation with Kirsten Newcomer, who's um, uh, as it says on the screen, a security strategist and very passionate about security here at Red Hat with me. Um, and she's um, kindly offered to reprise a, a presentation she's done called 10 Layers of Container Security, which is rocking awesome. And I'm really glad to have Kirsten here with me. So I'm going to let her um, do her talk. You can ask questions in the chat. Um, and we'll have live Q&A at the end and, um, and a bit of a conversation. So. Um, without any further ado, um, welcome to Tech and Talk, Kirsten. All right, thanks so much, Diane. So I'm really looking forward to talking with everyone on this topic. Um, I'm going to just kind of start not by talking about what containers are, because I am assuming that most of you already have a good idea about what containers are. Uh, and if you don't, I know that there's some terrific content uh, already recorded and available on, on OpenShift Commons um, that you can, where, where you can learn more. Uh, but what, what I did want to call out really is that <clears throat> containers change how we develop, deploy, and manage applications. And for that reason, they really affect both the development and the ops team. And there are different advantages for each team. We typically think about containers as, as really providing uh, advantages for the application development team, right? You get to package everything up in it with, with all its dependencies in one place. You can deploy that same container uh, to any environment you want your application to run. And you really you know, minimize the configuration challenges that you have, and it makes it much easier to, to share uh, your contents and your components components, but there's also real advantages for the ops team, right? A, a container application, uh, it has a smaller, lighter footprint. Um, if you choose to run on bare metal than running containers on virtual machines, of course, you can run on both. And they're more easily portable across different environments, whether it's bare metal, virtual, as already mentioned, or public cloud, private cloud, wherever you want. Um, that said, it's really important that security be taken into account when you think about adopting containers, especially in an enterprise environment and for the production environment. Um, and as you think about shifting workloads, the security team typically becomes involved and concerned. And so you want to be prepared to talk with your security team and your and and both as an ops and as a dev team about how do you, you work securely with containers. And that's what this conversation is all about. So kind of we think about securing containers in, in multiple ways here at Red Hat. We think about both the layers of the stack, of the solution stack, and the container lifecycle. So I'm going to go through um, each of these elements uh, kind of one by one. So I'm not, not going to kind of touch on them now. I'll just mention that you don't really need to be an expert on each of these areas for today's talk. I'm going to kind of go at a reasonably high level. And if you have a particular area that you'd like a deep dive on as a, as a future talk, you know, let's, let's uh, tee that up with Diane afterwards. We'll be happy to get into more. Um, one other note is that uh, I'm going to be talking about, th these are all things, the security things that I'm talking about are all things that you can do in a DIY container environment. Um, but I'm also going to use OpenShift as an example for how it's implemented with a container platform and how that makes it easier. Um, but certainly these are things that can be done both DIY and with a container platform. We're going to start with the container host and multi-tenancy. So many of our security teams have really gotten comfortable with how to secure VMs, and they get a little more concerned when the technology shifts to containers. And so from that point of view, the OS that you deploy your containers to really does matter. You want to be sure that you're taking advantage, that, that you have an OS that provides 
um, security capabilities and that you take advantage of those security capabilities. So of course, you know, from the Red Hat point of view, that's Red Hat Enterprise Linux and, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux Atomic Host. Um, a couple of the, the key capabilities to think about there, and since this is a tech audience, I can, I can get a little bit into these. Um, Linux namespaces provide the fundamentals of container isolation. The namespace provides abstraction, makes it appear to the processes within that namespace that they have their own instance of global resources. So that's a key element to, to rely on. SE Linux is used to keep containers isolated from each other and from the host. It allows administrators to enforce mandatory access controls for every user, application, process, and file. It's the brick wall that's gonna stop a process if it manages to break out of, accidentally or on purpose, the namespace abstraction. You know, a really concrete example here is that SE Linux provided mitigation of a, of a discovered container on entry vulnerability. For those of you who, who, who really wanna go there, you can look it up, it's CVE 2016-9962. But SE Linux was able to prevent processes from accessing host content, even if those container processes managed to gain access to actual file descriptors. Um, and Dan Walsh did a great blog on this, also something that you can look up. Um, control groups, again, because you're you one of the advantages of containers is you can run multiple applications. Uh, on a single system, and because they're packaged with their own dependencies, you don't have to worry about configuring that VM with, you know, that you know, what if what if one application requires a different version of Tomcat than the other? You can do that with your container environment, but you want to be conscious of being able to limit, account for, and isolate resource usage. So that involves your your CPU, your memory, disk I/O, network, etc. C groups allow you to ensure that containers won't be stomped on by another container on the same host. And then finally, the secure computing mode profile can be associated with a container to restrict available system calls. So really all of these are, are security capabilities that you can use for any running process. And in this context, you wanna think of containers as another running process and apply those security features and functions and principles that you would apply to any running process. Um, it's worth noting that, uh, so I'm sorry, another, another thing to think about, if you want to um, further enhance your security and minimize your attack surface, Red High, you know, Atomic Host is, is the host for you, right? That is a container op optimized operating system. And uh, it really makes it much easier to, uh, to it's, it's specifically tuned for containers uh, and really only has uh, the packages that you need to run containers. Uh, and it, there is no yum install. So people can't go out there and arbitrarily add uh, different packages to the environment. A further proof point of the security features available with Red Hat Enterprise Linux is that uh, RHEL 7.1 received common criteria certification, including certification of the Linux container framework support. So all of these kinds of things I've been talking about. And that's, so I'm not talking about the Docker runtime when I say that, right? But all of these surrounding capabilities were the first Linux distribution to receive uh, that common criteria certification for the Linux container framework support. Okay, so that's the OS and multi-tenancy. Um, we also wanna think about the content in your containers. Uh, you know, applications and infrastructure these days are, are really built from, that in, and built from existing sources. Absolutely, you add your own code, um, but you're often building on top of open source components, such as the Linux operating system for your infrastructure, Apache web server, JBoss enterprise application platform, Postgres, Node.js. So containerized versions of these packages are now readily available and you don't have to build your own container for the containerized version of them. But as with any code you download from an external source, you need to know where the packages originally came from, who built them, and whether there's any malicious code inside them. So Red Hat provides a large number of certified images 
including the RHEL base images, various language runtimes, middleware databases, and more on the Red Hat container catalog. Red Hat certified containers run anywhere Enterprise Linux runs from bare metal to VMs, and they're supported by Red Hat and our partners. So the container image content that we deliver is packaged from known source, and Red Hat provides security monitoring on these packages. So you can see in this screenshot, this is a, a screenshot of something we, uh, a feature that we added to the container catalog in May um, called the Container Health Index. So we are publicly exposing the grade of each container image, de detailing you know, information you might need about any known vulnerabilities so that you can be sure that you are aware before you download the content of the security aspects of that container. And of course, uh, we keep up to date with uh, security fixes and patches, and we will rebuild those container images when, whenever security fixes are released, as you can see in this, in this screenshot, uh, version uh, 3.4-1315, uh, you know, new vulnerability was discovered. We released 3-4.1316 with a vulnerability fix and the grade went back up. Of course, there are gonna be times when you need content that Red Hat doesn't provide. And in those situations, you, we recommend you use container scanning tools. Um, there are a number of them out there on the market. Many of them use continuously updated vulnerability databases, uh, and they will help you identify the open source components inside the container image and identify any known vulnerabilities associated with those components. Some of the scanners will also do commercial software, but, but a majority of them are really focused on, on open source content. So you can think about things like um, JFrog X-Ray, Twistlock, Aqua Security, Black Duck Hub. These are some of the things out there. For Limage, uh, I'm sorry, for Red Hat content also, we provide uh, a scanner called Open SCAP that you can use as well. So. So you've got a bunch of content that you may have downloaded from a public source, um, but that's really only the starting point for the applications that you're building, the applications that really drive the business value for your company. Right? So you want to be sure that you manage access to and promotion of the container images that your teams use, both the ones you download, but also the ones you build just as you would manage access to and promotion of any other type of binary. So you can do that using uh, a container registry or a binary repository that knows how to work with containers. Um, and you start to see both terms used in the industry these days, but typically they're referring to things like JFrog's Artifactory, Sonatype Nexus binary repository, Docker Trusted Registry, um, and OpenShift comes with an integrated registry that we call the Atomic Registry you can use to manage your container images, but OpenShift also integrates with uh, the popular uh, binary repos registries, container registries that are available, the ones that I've already mentioned. So when you think about a registry, <clears throat> you wanna be sure that it provides, that it enables uh, you to, to um, store and see security metadata on your images, um, that you have access controls, that you can do things like say, you know, hey, this image is, this image is okay for deployment in production, uh, but this, this image, uh, this other image is only okay for deployment in a development environment because it hasn't been fully vetted yet. So you really want policy controls, the ability to apply policy controls in your registry as well. Um, and one of the big values here is that, you know, if you have those kinds of policies in place, or if you choose to have multiple registries, maybe one's only for dev and for sandbox and another is only for production, you can, you can make it easy for the dev teams to use things that haven't yet gone through the full vetting process and explore, but you make sure that they don't get into your production environment unless they've been fully vetted. Similarly, builds are a really important part of the security process, right? As with any application, managing production builds is a key element of your, of your process. You need a definitive build environment for your production container deployment. 
you really don't want developers doing Docker build on their laptops and then deploying that build to production because that's not a reproducible build environment. So you want to integrate your, you want your container build process to use the kind of uh, automated and integrated CI process that you do for other types of applications. And if you're not doing that yet, you should, you should really be looking into it. There are a lot of great tools for automating, uh, automating your builds and doing continuous integration. Um, OpenShift comes with an integrated instance of Jenkins for CI and can also be integrated with uh, your own CI environment if you prefer. And again, if you're doing this yourself, you can put together uh, you know, a, a process that includes your preferred CI tools. Um, you don't have to have an, a, a container platform. We just think it makes it easier if you've kind of got everything in one place. There's less for you to maintain. You can let somebody else maintain it. So once you've got a, a build completed, the image should be pushed to a registry, just as we've been talking about earlier. Um, and that can be done automatically when you use OpenShift, uh, for example. You also want to be sure, again, that you proactively check container contents over time. Right? New vulnerabilities are identified daily. So just because you, you, uh, your image was vulnerability free at the time you did your build doesn't mean it's going to stay vulnerability free, even if the code hasn't changed at all. So again, you want to leverage tools like OpenSCAP, Black.Hub, JFrog X-Ray as part of your CI process. Um, just like you would integrate other types of security tools, uh, like security static analysis tools, like IBM Rational App Scan or HP Fortify, look that that you look to that you use to look at your own source code. You want to use these other types of security tools to introspect the container images that you're working with. Another really great thing about containers that actually can help you to enhance the security in a, in a more automated fashion is the layered packaging model. So that layered packaging model, if you work in a, in a regulated environment that requires separation of concerns in some cases, the layered packaging model really helps you do that. You can have your operations team be responsible for the core build, perhaps the, the RHEL images that they pull down from Red Hat. Um, you can have your architects be responsible for adding the middleware content. So, so layering the middleware content on top of that core build image. And then your app dev team really only needs to think about the code that they need to write to, to develop that application and, uh, and build that full container. And when you take this kind of approach and you have a fully integrated um, or, or automated, apologies, a fully automated CI process, you can also look at triggers to help you know when to rebuild containers. So those triggers really kind of span both the container build and the container deployment topic. So I'm gonna talk about them a, a, a little bit here. Um, but before I do that, let's, let's talk again about um, some additional things you need to do around, around deployment and continuous deployment for security. Let's say you've run your CI process, you've run all your scanners, there are no known security issues uh, with the images that the contents of the images that you've built, and you're ready to push to deploy, you're, you're, you're ready to deploy to production. Well, it may be that without realizing it, you've got a container, uh, an application container that requires that it be run with root privileges in order to, to do everything it knows how to do. But your security team or your production team has a, a policy that says no container is allowed to run as root. And in fact, that's a really good security best practice, right? Don't let your containers run as root, just don't do it. So you wanna leverage um, any capabilities you can to do things like automatically prevent privileged deployment of privileged containers. So Kubernetes and OpenShift come with something called security context constraints, which allow you to do that automatically, right? You can, it, you can monitor the, I'm sorry. So you can make sure that the SE Linux context is defined for a container. You can check to see if it requires root privs. If it does, you can prevent it from being deployed. Whole sets of things that you can do here. 
It, it's also worth mentioning at this point for any of you who are really familiar with SE Linux, a lot of folks are used to turning that off in their base rail images because not every application knows how to run in an SE Linux environment. One of the nice things about the containerized application running on OpenShift is that OpenShift manages SE Linux for you and containerizing that application means that you can take advantage of the protections SE Linux provides you without having, with, without having to worry about those SE Linux uh, elements. So it really gives you the ability to have a much more secure environment. So back to uh, triggers and thinking about image registries, right? You want to monitor those image registries again to make sure that you um, become aware if a newly discovered vulnerability shows up. And if it does, you want triggers in place to make sure the, the appropriate people know about it. So let's take a look at an application that's building, that's, that's built using the three container image layers that I talked about earlier, core, middleware, and finally the application layer. If an issue is discovered in the core image and you've got these kind of monitoring capabilities available, you'll get notification that uh, that, that core image has a known vulnerability. You also ideally would get notification that a new image is available from the original public repo you pulled that core image from. Uh, these are capabilities that, that OpenShift supports. So you get notification and you can then, using these triggers, automatically restart your CI CD process for that application so that the uh, core and middleware image is rebuilt using that updated core image, and then the application is rebuilt using that updated middleware image. And you make sure, of course, that as part of this, the application goes through all of its uh, security tests and its UAT testing. And now you're in a position where you can deploy the updated container uh, to an environment. You don't need to take down the old one yet. You, you deploy that new one, you migrate users over, you make sure that everything's up and running, good in production, and then you can take down that vulnerable uh, container. On the other hand, if it's a severe vulnerability, you may decide you want to stop that container right away uh, while you go through this process. So by leveraging and automating your continuous integration and continuous deployment process with OpenShift, the entire process of rebuilding the app to incorporate latest fixes, testing, and making sure it's deployed everywhere within your environment can be 100% automated with whatever uh, additional gates and policies you wish to incorporate. So let's talk a little bit more about the container platform. So if you're using, you know, when it, one of the big reasons for using a container platform is the orchestration features that help you manage container deployments at scale, right? You need to, you, you, you really want, again, automation, orchestration to help manage uh, which containers should be deployed to which hosts, uh, monitoring host capacity, you know, container discovery, knowing which containers need to access each other. Um, and controlling access to, management of shared resources, monitoring container health. So all of these things are, are typically offered through your orchestration platform, right? And OpenShift delivers orchestration through Kubernetes, um, which many of you know probably was originally developed by Google. So uh, one of the key concepts of, the, or of a container platform in this orchestration is that it's the master nodes that, that really have um, all of this control and, and capability to kind of manage deployment and process around the, uh, the places that your application containers are deployed. And for that reason, the masters have a fair amount of privilege in order to do that work. So you really need to be sure that you have strong multi-tenant security on the platform itself. You want to be sure that you have the ability um, to isolate uh, different teams, applications, or deployment environments from each other. You may want to do something like, say, uh, isolate a dev, a test, and a production environment from each other. That's a pretty common use case. Um, 
And one of the other things you really want to get out of a container or platform is the self-service capabilities that really make it easy for the dev teams to do what they want to do and, and really helps kind of make it faster to get those applications out there that, again, support the business value. So, so you need to balance what the dev teams need, that nice self-service experience, with the ops and security teams' needs for really kind of managing security of that production environment. And a, and a really good container platform helps you do that. Some of the other things, um, and actually, let, let me talk for a minute. So, so part of that, uh, part of a secure multi-tenant master, making sure that all access to the master is over TLS, um, controlling access to the API server, ideally, you know, an X.509 certificate, token-based, um, the ability to use project quotas to limit how much damage a rogue token could do. All of things are, are things you want to be sure you've got. Um, ideally, you also want to be thinking about a platform that supports image signing, right? Makes it easy as you as you build those images to sign them. Maybe you use uh, external signing, but you also need to verify the signatures as part of your deployment process. And you want secrets management. So this is a place where um, the OpenShift has uh, some capabilities today, right? You can mount secrets into containers using a volume plugin. Uh, the system can use secrets to perform actions on behalf of a, a pod. etcd is the place where OpenShift stores tenant secrets today. Um, and today, you know, in, in uh, OpenShift 3.5, that's not, etcd is not as secure as many enterprises would like it to be. So this is a place Red Hat is investing. And when OpenShift 3.6.1 ships, we will have secrets encrypted at rest uh, in etcd. We're also investing to make it easier to integrate uh, external certificate authorities and vaults for improved secrets management. Um, so there's a lot that can be done uh, in this space already and more to come. And again, you also want to think about integration with the security ecosystem and how well the platform performs there. And, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. Okay, so network defense. Right, traditional data centers, traditional applications, network defense is, is a big part of the way the security team thinks about this. You know, how do I how do I manage, how do I protect my internal environment from the external? How do I segment things on my network? But and 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 you need to think about this for containers as well. Um, that said. Really, we think one of the best ways to do this, given the scale at which containers are coming and going in, in a, an enterprise environment, is you really want to be using software-defined networking as a way to help automate this. So the first line in network defense comes from network namespaces. Um, and with... Uh, Okay, so sorry, this is my the area that I'm least deep in, so I rely on my cheat sheets here. <laughs> so, okay. And if you guys want a, a deep dive on this, I know just the person to have to come in and do a deep dive. So, Please, but but like this, but you haven't been using cheat sheets the whole way because I'm totally impressed by that. <laughs> <laughs> I use some cheat sheets, I'll admit it. <laughs> it's a mix. <laughs> but, there's enough acronyms in there so far to you know just to slay me. I have the one. <laughs> That just popped Please. up. I think this might be a good time just to ask it. Edward was sure. asking, um, is there because you showed us the registry um, dash health check, and that I yep. think is for Red Hat um, images for Red Hat. Red yes. Hat. Is there yes, something good. into OpenShift, um, or is it all third-party stuff that shows um, that would have a health page for container images or something similar in the OpenShift registry? I, oh, I, that's that's yep. That's a great question. Um, there are a couple of ways to show security data uh, in the OpenShift UI, and, and you are correct that the Red Hat Container Catalog today provides the health index just on Red Hat images, um, and we may ex extend that over time to the rest of the images that are available from the Red Hat Container Catalog. All the images are supported, but the health index is only available on Red Hat content. So when it comes to looking at uh, security data in OpenShift itself, there are a couple of places that, that you can, can see that show up. So for example, um, 
OpenShift comes with a tool called CloudForms, which is part of the, the management offering uh, for from Red Hat, and it and it helps you kind of uh, manage across a, a, a wide variety of deployment environments. And OpenShift is one of the ways. I'm sorry, CloudForms is one of the ways you can run OpenSCAP scans, which I mentioned earlier. So if you need to know the vulnerability data about Red Hat content, you can, uh, you know, and and maybe you aren't going back to the to the uh, image for the container catalog for some reason, you've already got that image stored in your registry, you can run an open SCAP scan. And if, um, and there is a UI, I don't have a screenshot in this deck, but there is a UI where you will see the results of that scan. Um, and if there's a, a known vulnerability discovered and you have your policies set appropriately, um, you can prevent deployment of that vulnerable image. You know, there, so there are multiple ways to prevent deployment of vulnerable images. Uh, the Atomic Registry also has a GUI, um, and I'll be honest, I'll have to, to um, look, you know, get one of my colleagues to tell me exactly what's visible, whether the, the metadata that I was talking about is visible uh, in the GUI, through the CLI, I will look into that. Um, but registries like uh, JFrog's uh, Artifactory Registry or Sonotype Nexus, they absolutely do show you that kind of vulnerability data. And many of the scanners um, have integrations so that you can uh, see some of that data from uh, other third-party scanners in those registries. Thanks. Sure. Okay, so back to networks and namespaces. Right, so with network namespaces, each collection of containers, known as a pod, gets its own IP and port range to bind to, which allows you to isolate pod networks from each other on the nodes. Um, and because, again, the proliferation of IP addresses and ports makes networking more complicated when you have a, a large-scale container deployment, we really strongly recommend um, using SDNs, to, to a software-defined networking to help you handle that complexity. So OpenShift comes with the, what's the OS, OBS multi-tenant plugin, right? So we come, OpenShift platform comes with software-defined networking. Um, you can also uh, plug in other SDNs if you have a preference. And an example might be Nuage would be another software-defined networking that you could plug into OpenShift. Um, and so, but, but, but the real point is, right, that you want to make sure that if you're doing a container platform, that you leverage, that, that it has the ability to, to, to leverage software-defined networking, that it gives you the ability to plug in the, the SDN of your choice. And again, that, that really doing this at scale is going to be very difficult with, with traditional networking tools. Um, that said, you can also, you know, another thing that comes up frequently with security teams is they're used to using network scanners as part of their protection scheme for the network environment. So uh, what we recommend around that is, is that many of those network scanners, if they're not yet designed for software-defined networking, tools like those and others like them can be containerized and, and can be run as super-privileged containers. Um, you just have to make a, a, an exempt, you know, a special uh, uh, policy for them to give them the level of privilege that they need. Um, but it is one of the things to think about. There's there's actually a lot of capability available um, in these in these solutions, and and so definitely worth um, thinking about there. Something else to mention quickly, right, is that uh, there is the ability to control egress traffic. Uh, using either a router or a firewall method so that you can use, again, more traditional methods such as IP whitelisting. Um, you might use that to control which users have access to certain databases. Um, and uh, introduced as a tech preview in OpenShift 3.5, there's a new network policy plugin that uh, improves upon the way the OBS multi-tenant plugin can be used. Uh, to configure allowable traffic between pods. So the network policy allows configuration of isolation policies at the level of individual pods. And this is still in tech preview in OpenShift 3.6. 
Um, but again, lots of great capabilities here. And, and this is a space where, um, you know, a traditional security team will be particularly interested. Okay, trying to keep an eye on the time too here, but I think we're good. Um, storage, right? There's a lot of conversation today about stateless applications, and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there's still a lot of uh, applications out there that need storage. Um, and even if you're doing a, a stateless app, you might want to uh, store some information somewhere. Uh, and, and so that's really where attached storage comes in. And of course, you need to secure your attached storage. Um, so a container platform with orchestration tools, again, makes that easier. OpenShift has plugins for multiple flavors of storage, including NFS, AWS Elastic Block Stores, uh, GCE Persistent Disks, ClusterFS, iSCSI, Ceph, Cinder, and there are, the, the way in which you protect your storage volumes really varies depending on the type of storage. So a persisted volume can be mounted on a host in a way that, that is supported by the resource provider, such as read write once, read only many, read write many. Um, block storage, such as EBS, GCE, um, iSCSI, you can use your SE Linux capabilities to secure the root of the mounted volume, making the mounted volume owned by and only visible to the container it's associated with. And for shared storage, like NFS, Ceph, or Gluster, you can manage that by adding the group ID of the persistent volume to the supplemental groups of the pod. So, and then by default, you wanna be sure that data in transit is, is encrypted, which on OpenShift, it's encrypted via HTTPS for all components communicating between each other. API management is another thing to think about, right? Again, as especially when we start thinking about, uh, you know, newer applications that are composed of microservices, um, but also really for any application that has externally facing APIs. Um, you really want to think about how are you going to get appropriate governance of those APIs. And one approach that we'd recommend is using an API management tool. So OpenShift now includes a containerized version of the three-scale API gateway that helps you manage API security. So three-scale gives you a variety of standard options for API authentication and security. Um, and in addition, you have the option to use application and account plans that let you restrict access to specific endpoints, methods, services, and apply access policies to group of groups of users. One of the cool things about application plans, if you use an API gateway, is that they allow you to set rate limits for API usage and control traffic flow for groups of, of users. So this is a way that, that, you know, and you can also automatically trigger overage alerts. So that's, that's a, can sometimes be a good indication if you get a sudden spike in usage, you know, you wanna be able to stop that quickly. It could be an indication of an attack. So if you're getting uh, alerted about over, overuse, you know, applications that reach or exceed rate limits gives you a great indication that it's something that you need to look into. So a lot of good things to think about there too. Okay. Federated clusters. This is actually a futures looking or a forward looking slide um, and something that uh, Red Hat and the Kubernetes community are, are working on. Um, federation is useful for very large scale high availability global deployments that require multiple clusters and multiple availability zones. Um, you can use federated clusters to, uh, the concept is you can, you can use this to manage more than one uh, data center in different regions, but also, and that could be with, with the same public cloud provider or federated clusters might, will also help you manage uh, across different public cloud providers. So there's, there's some really cool stuff coming here. And if you're managing federated clusters, you need to be sure again that your orchestration tools have the security you need across those different deployment platforms. So some of the key elements that are in the works here are federated secrets, 
uh, giving you the ability to automatically create and manage secrets across all the clusters in a federation, making sure that the secrets are kept globally consistent and up to date, even when some clusters are offline, and federated namespaces, right? Creating namespaces in the federation control plane to make sure they're synchronized across all the clusters in the federation. So once again, this is forward looking. This is something that's, that's in progress. Uh, there are elements of this in Kubernetes today, and Red Hat, again, is working with the community to get these ready for enterprise support. I mentioned the security ecosystem earlier. So again, if you're, if you're a security professional or, or you're talking to your security team, there's a whole series of, of security tools that um, the, the security teams are already using today or that they, they really want to be sure can be used um, in a containerized environment. And so some of these include uh, special identity and access management tools. Of course, most of us think about things like Active Directory, but there are also tools that are focused on privileged access management. And security teams often use those tools to make sure not only that they're controlling privileged access, but that they can audit it. Um, I mentioned earlier, external certificate authority, authorities, external vaults and key management solutions, the container content scanners that I've talked about, as well as other types of vulnerability management tools. There are also some container runtime analysis tools, both Aqua Security and Twistlock uh, mm -hmm. do some container runtime analysis. Those, those are useful. And again, you want to be integrating with your security team's information and event monitoring system. So you want to be collecting the logs from your container deployment, both the platform and the applications, but, but in particular, the, the platform is probably the most interesting thing to your security team. You want to flow that information into that information and event monitoring environment uh, so that it can be aggregated, aggregated and viewed in the tools that, that the teams are used to. So again, you want you want to be sure that as you look for really you know really look to productize and and broad scale deployments that you are thinking about uh, solutions that help you do this kind of integration. So um, as I said, uh, you know we think of course that OpenShift is one of the best ways that you can do that. Um, we support the, all the kinds of capabilities that I've been describing, and in addition, of course, you can you know, do this yourself by using some of the open source community tools. Uh, we think you get that added value from OpenShift of having it all in one place, having it be supported, and knowing that you've got a, a stable a enterprise partner to work with and help you manage all those pieces together. Um, we do have, we, uh, Diane will, will have a, a PDF available of this with some links to some additional information. Um, including the, the 10 layers of container security goes into kind of a lot of the content that I've covered today, um, and in some cases in more depth. And I would be happy to take questions. All right, well, there, there is one more question um, here, and, and it really thanks, because first, um, thank you for doing this, because one, I do lots of talks on each individual aspect, um, uh, of security and uh, we just last week we did something with new vector um, who was doing network security and SDN you know like checking out the network layer and uh, you know and I th I think this is the first time that I've seen someone do um, a presentation that covered enough of each of the different areas so that you actually understood how they were all um, interconnected and necessary so um, and this has been great for, for me because it, pull, it sort of pulls all of that together, um, and and um, I mean I I really appreciate it. So thank you for that. Um, Edward is asking a question. Um, you mentioned like you mentioned Twistlock and Aquasect and JFrog and a few others as well. But she, he's wondering if you have any thoughts about Sysdig, Falco, or other utilities to help monitor. Oh. You know, yeah. you get to play with all of them. So in your in your role. <laughs> Those, those are good questions, and, and I'll be honest, let's say I'm not as up to speed on Sysdig as I'd like to be, um, and I'm not sure if I've heard of Falco before. Is that F-A-L-C-O? Yeah, that's what he's saying, and I'm going to unmute him okay. so he can ask his question. We can unmute sure. himself, too, and um, let's see if we can get him to do this. Where is I Edward? Think... There we go. See if Edward, Edward, how about if you ask your question? 
Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for this, Kirsten. Uh, yeah, uh, we're looking at some utilities to help monitor containers, uh, running containers. Uh, so we kind of found the utility from Sysdig, they have their utility that's sort of like a TCP dump. Uh, but they also mm -hmm. have another product called Falco, which allows you to set up a policy and alerting. So if a shell gets spawned up in a container, uh, that can be a message that alerts a team or so. Okay, interesting. Well, they both, I, I will definitely make uh, a point of learning more about those. Um, it sounds to me that they are, Falco at least, would be complementary with uh, something like Black Duck Hub or JFrog X-Ray. Um, Twistlock and Aqua Security have um, two solutions that, that, um, that and, and one of which may be uh, an interesting one to explore. Um, so both of them have scanners and then container runtime analysis. And, and uh, at least my understanding of how the Twistlock runtime analysis works is that um, it takes a look at all of the information in, in the Docker file and everything kind of when, when that, when it takes a look at the container image before it's launched, it collects a bunch of config info. It also um, monitors kind of the initial behavior of the application in the container when it's first launched so that it gets a sense of what the pattern is for the container behavior. Um, and then it, if, if it sees deviations from that pattern, it would also notify. So I don't know how that compares to the way Falco determines what, when to notify you, um, but, but I will definitely look to get up to speed on, on both Sysdig and Falco. So I know that I've um, had the Sysdig folks on before in an OpenShift Commons briefing, so um, I'll post, uh, Edward, I'll send you um, an email if you share your email with me with, with some links to that. But about three weeks ago, um, the Aquasec, um, Liz Rice did a, a, a tech and talk, and she's also done a really interesting um, open source project under uh, Aquasec. It's in their GitHub repo called Kube Bench, which takes the, um, what is this? I'm going to say it correctly, the Center for Internet Security's Kubernetes benchmarking um, tests and automates them to run against your Kubernetes, a really interesting project. Um, so you might want to take a look at that. Kube-Bench is something that's also out there and you could possibly take a look at. And I know New Vector is also using those um, security benchmarks too in their offering. So this, the thing about security, there's so many angles at it, um, that, but it's interesting yeah. to see um, the different approaches people take. And your question earlier, Edward, about the dashboard stuff, and, and I'd love to see a visualization, in, even if it's a third-party one, um, baked into OpenShift as well, um, so that it those alerts. And, and that's part of the thing. I can you know, normally in Tech and Talk, I'm not so OpenShifty, um, but um, one of the things is OpenShift can't be everything to everybody. So we really love working with um, these third-party folks who are experts in these things and um, integrate very easily with, with OpenShift and Kubernetes. Um, so there's, there's lots of them, there's lots of content out there. So um, please. Yeah, absolutely. A, a comment on the, on the Kube bench, the CIS benchmark. My, my best understanding is that you, you use those benchmarks really for making sure that the overall deployment environment is secured yeah. to the platform and the environment and that, that, something like uh, Aqua Security, Twistlock, and it sounds like also Falco are more about um, the behavior of the application. Ed Edward, is that right, that Falco's monitoring the application behavior? Yeah, correct. It's a, it's a kernel module that gets loaded and uh, based on, I guess, a pattern or a, a call, uh, you can have it uh, alerts uh, based on an event. Ah, interesting. So I'm definitely going to look into that. Cool. Thank you. Love it when I learn something new. <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely adore hearing a new one. So, um, and also, um, I will try and get someone from the CloudForms team to do a talk on um, the open scap scanning, yeah. um, integrating yeah. to sometime in the not too distant future. Um, I know just the person for I, you to, to reach I out. Found, to. I found. I remembered reading a blog post somewhere, and I, I found it and I popped it into the chat for 
for folks. Okay. Who can that. And yeah. um, if you know the person, that would be great. Well, I, yeah, would I was going to suggest um, it might be a different person, but but go ahead. No, who who would your person be? I'm always so Lucy, your yeah, Lucy Kerner does an awesome presentation on using not just cloud forms, but cloud forms, Ansible insights um, to automate the configuration of um, the initial configuration of security profiles. So using using OpenSCAP and then to uh, audit and automatically remediate as well. Um, so she's got some great knowledge in this space. Yeah, if I've heard her name bandied about, I think I've actually met her um, uh -huh. once or twice in, in the hallways at some conference because that's where I meet everybody from Red Hat. Is uh -huh. never, never at a Red Hat facility. Um, it's always at conference. <laughs> Yeah. Did you know? Yeah, I, you work for Red Hat. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, cool. So, um, the the other thing, I'm always looking for um, suggestions on other people um, to have on and the tech and talk. Um, people who are passionate about um, some aspect of technology. Do you have any other suggestions, Percy? Yeah, you know, I do have one other person in mind, and I just, but I, I probably, I did not get a chance to connect and see whether. Um, you know, she. This is someone. I guess I can share her name. She's presented uh, at other um, events okay. publicly. Well, so, Alex. Force them. I'm sorry. I'll Say try it again. Force them. Yeah. No. I. I. I can put you in touch. Um, but Alexandra Schulman is a VP of an innovation center at Citigroup, um, and she's a great person. And and of course, the people I'm going to think of are in the security space. Yeah. Um, but she's a great person. Uh, she does does some to talk about uh, the implications of security, you know, for you know cloud native apps and as as things change, um, you know, what are the what are the angles to think about there? So she's a possibility. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm also um, hosting an event in um, December, the OpenShift Commons Gathering, and looking for speakers for that. Um, and I've been trying to find a good security speaker, so that might be a good slot um, to try and force her into doing something there. Because um, KubeCon's coming up um, December 6th, 7th, um, and we always do a big OpenShift gathering the day before. Sort of think of it as a prep session for KubeCon um, and get all the updates before you go in so then you can go with loaded with questions. So um, we'll, we'll try and see if we, we can reach out and get some of those folks there. So. Kristen, thank you so much for taking the time today to, to, to give this talk. It really um, was awesome. I, I can't thank, you know, I'll, I'll add in the links that you had um, and post this as a blog post along with the slides um, on blog.openshift.com and tweet it out as well. And it'll be uploaded on YouTube under the Tech and Talk um, playlist oh. shortly, along with lots awesome. of other. So um, again, thank you very much. My pleasure, and, and thanks for the good questions, especially from, from Edward. I know there may have been others, but thank you.